The title of Professor Katz's talk is Five Concept in Search of Retirement, and it is going to deal with the career of concept in the social cycle of, of media research, opinion leader, two-step flow, selectivity, cross-pressure, and spirals. Please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, <laughs> Professor Elihu Katz. Thank you very much, Yuri, except that you used all my time. <laughs> How much time do I have? As long as you, as you, as long as you wish or, or as long as I stop you. <laughs> okay. And you forgot to say that it's a very cheap fare between Jerusalem and Haifa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted, well, five concepts in search of retirement, or you might prefer five concepts in search of immortality. They're not contradictory. And, um, I wanted to begin, no good? I wanted to begin as well by words of eulogy to Tamar Liebes, with whom I worked for many years. Well, we heard a good review of her work. And what you didn't say and it's not a coincidence, is that we should also remember tonight the death of Leah Van Leer. Leah Van Leer was unknown to any of you because her interest was in film. She was an immigrant from Romania, and she introduced in Haifa the idea of film clubs and ultimately, the idea of a cinematheque, which is now a central institution in the cultural life of the three big cities and elsewhere. And the relationship to Liebes is interesting because Liebes combined humanities and social sciences, pushing us more in the direction of humanities, which I infer many of you are involved in uh, connecting. But, and it reminds me as well of the question of how did we escape an interest in cinema as communication scholars? How is that conceivable? And yet it's true, and it leads to my famous conclusion that God gave cinema to the humanities and television to the social science. <laughs> it's true. I can't think of any other good reason. Okay, that's point one, and not yet my talk. Point two is about what I'm not talking about. We had originally thought we the organizers, that I would talk about something rather new, well maybe not so new, but relatively new in my work, namely what I call situation of contact as a variable affecting the effect of the media. That is to say, in what context are the media received? And what's the effect of that context on how much and what kind of influence the message might have? Anyway, so we decided that I, I decided that we would not talk about the situation of contact. So instead I brought two papers which are representative of my interest and I hope of the interest of some of you in the question negle much neglected of situation of contact and to whom I attribute uh, 
priority to a guy named Elliot Freitzen, and I don't know if any of you remember him or know his name, and I've lost contact with him too, who first introduced the idea that people go to the movies with their girlfriend, they stay at home to watch television with their family, they read the newspaper alone, and so on. And this stayed with me and led to these two papers. One is called, um, one is called Communicator Control of the Conditions of Reception. And that's the idea, I'll spend a minute on this. Uh, it, it has to do with the idea that communicators can't be so dumb, as some of us have been, in ignoring the fact that God spoke to Moses at a burning bush. And that that situation of contact made a difference in the message, and so on. So we look at the situation of contact in terms of geography, time, why are people more likely to donate money on Thanksgiving to charities and so on. Anyway, that's what paper one is about, and you're welcome to take a copy. The other paper on situation of contact is much more recent, and it's called Back to the Streets. And the argument is, that, or Katz's argument, is that the broadcast media, or put it this, put it more radically, the major effect of the broadcast media, or the mass media, if you like, is to have moved politics inside the home and thus neutralized it. And the major potential of the small media, like the Arab Spring, like in the Arab Spring, is to have moved politics outside again. Anyway, that's the thesis of the second paper. And if it weren't for the election, uh, which makes it impossible for me to stay, I would propose giving a second talk on the first theme that we aren't talking about. Now to the talk. Um, I think uh, out of a sense of um, uh, old age, I ha um, I've preferred to talk about something that you've already forgotten than to talk about things that you might be doing and of which I am probably a laggard. So I want to go back to the to five concepts, not arbitrary, because that four of them at least have their origin in the early Lassusfeld studies of voting. And they are opinion leader, two-step flow, selectivity, cross pressures, and Neule Neumann spiral of silence, but which Columbia also had a share in, in a different formulation, which I will get to. But what I'm trying to say is that those <laughs> concepts either are seeking retirement or immortality, but either not so much in their original form, but in the transformations they've undergone over the years still showing, you can, and I hope we have a chance to discuss this, despite the room, which makes it a little more difficult, uh, that even after the transformation, the, the transformation that these concepts have undergone, that it's still, they're still about limited effects. That is to say that persuasion by the media is difficult, and they propose to explain why. Now you can say that's wrong, especially, as we'll see, if these concepts don't work, which they may not. And so you can help me. I don't know the answer to this. I bring you thoughts that I associated with the possibility that you might be 
share, you might share some of these worries. <coughs> but anyway, let me know. So what I want to do is take these five concepts. Actually, if it's easier for you, you can look at them as a pair. Opinion leaders and two-step flow as two pairs plus one. Opinion leaders plus two-step flow, selectivity, and cross pressures. Then I'll show why. And what I want to show is where they came from, all in a word each, and how they were transformed, and what methodologies, how methodologies have basically improved since the early days. Uh, my in my youth, but still the disciple of Paul Lazarsfeld, to whom I dedicate these remarks. Okay, so let's do them one by one, and then I hope we can have a discussion. So first, opinion leaders. Lazarsfeld, unknown to anybody, I think, wasn't interested in voting, wasn't interested in radio, not initially. He was interested in the process of decision making. And when he landed in the United, or after a few years in the United States, he saw a big opportunity to study decision making in a panel study of voting in 1940 presidential election, which is a lot of years ago. The first discovery of that study, or the first that I'll mention, is interpersonal influence, which is interesting because that was a rebuttal of the idea of atomized mass society. The people actually talk to each other. That was a quotes discovery, or not quotes discovery, and it was conceived originally, at least in my version, as competitive to the mass media, and therefore as a, a barrier to media influence. But in any case, it was originally conceived as competing <coughs> with radio and newspapers. Television hadn't been born yet. And it was found that the opinion leaders specialize in certain areas, and that ultimately the original idea that people attributed influence to, to others subsided in favor of conversation. So opinion leaders, the, the, the concept is basically being um, reborn in terms of interpersonal conversation, which is reborn as conversation, and ultimately transforms to diffusion. Diffusion studies of the kind that are now increasingly popular, thanks, well, I'll say why in a minute. Second, the two-step flow, it's obviously related to opinion leaders, because in the same study, Lazarsfeld discovered that people to whom others attributed influence when they were interviewed in a kind of snowball design, when the opinion leaders were, when the influentials were interviewed alongside of the influencees, it was found that the influentials are more exposed to the media than the people whom they influence. So that gave rise to the idea of two-step flow. Media, opinion leaders, and influencees. And this was pounced upon by publishers like True Story Magazine, McFadden Publications, which doesn't exist anymore, or Time Magazine, which also doesn't exist anymore, perhaps because they were so enthusiastic about the possibility that their readers might contain relatively high proportions of opinion leaders, and so they could claim that their circulations were, and effects were much more impressive than the statistics of uh, exposure. 
And then there was another problem resulting from this, and that's the famous paper by Todd Gitlin, if you know it, which attacks the findings of Lazarsfeld studies, including personal influence, which Laz uh, Lazarsfeld and I co-authored, saying, look, you're just hiding behind opinion leaders because all they do is relay what the media tells them to say to their influencees, and thus Columbia is really collaborating secretly and for crass interests with these, with the media, especially the Columbia Broadcasting System at the time. So that was a problem, and thus the idea of opinion leader was parlayed into the idea, not of a relay, but as a filter, that the opinion leader was a referee, was a judge who decided what to pass on after he filtered it through the norms of the primary group with which he was associated. He, she, it actually was more she's than he's were associated. That's interesting because that's another break or another explanation of limited effects. Like interpersonal influence, or as a kind of interpersonal influence, there was an opinion leader who filtered the news or the message of the media so that it didn't contrast or, or uh, confront or uh, whatever the word is, uh, the norms of the primary groups. So that was, but that's been little studied, whether the opinion leader actually does filter information. Because, the, uh, well also because, the, the opinion leader idea and the two-step flow were basically transformed into network theory. Two steps were an arbitrary number available methodologically at the time, but 60 years or 70 years later, we can use the computer to study endless networks and endless diffusion so that that concept is also in search of retirement or immortality, whichever you think. Those are the first two. The next two are about selectivity. So another reason that the mass media were judged to be less persuasive than had been anticipated in view of their ostensible power was that not everybody was in the audience. The audience was very selective. And one major basis of selectivity, it was argued, was not to expose yourself to things that disagree with you. That to be selective by choosing things that reinforce, which is a central concept, in the limited effects theory that reinforce what you already believe. So it again limits the power of the media to persuade to change, or so it seems. But in any case, uh, selectivity is having a bad day. We have to hear from Yariv whether, which side of this argument you and uh, Shira are on because uh, Lacour and others are now saying they can't find any selectivity in uh, uh, audience behavior, audience exposure to the news. That is, many leftists view uh, Netanyahu, uh, I don't mean it, but as many leftists view Fox News as rightist view uh, whatever, uh, W, um, anyway, I'm blocking. MSNBC. I'm blocking, not a rightist. Um, anyway, 
it's a big question of whether selectivity, and I believe that for interpersonal relations, the data supports selectivity. As far as I can see, selectivity has transformed into homophily. That is, birds of a feather flock together. Independent of what, uh, uh, I have to figure out what's wrong with Lacour and why Tzvati and uh, support him, if it's true. I'm not sure, I'm not really sure. But anyway, um, that leads me to cross pressures. I should mention that, uh, what are their names? Dr. Say it loud. Christakis and Fowler. Uh, Christakis and Fowler are along this line of homophily. And, okay, let's leave it there. I have more to say, but you know their work, right? That people who are fat like to be friends with people who are fat, and if they're not yet fat, they'll become fat. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cross pressures which is in a pair with selectivity. Cross pressures is central, I don't know about central, but is a major point in Lassfeld's early work on voting. He, he took demographics as the, as the definition of cross pressure. If you were a Catholic, uh, an industrialist or a Protestant worker, you are presumably under cross pressures to vote Democratic and Republican. One side tends to be Democrat, workers the other side, or Catholics. The other side, Republicans and uh, industrialists tend to be Republican. That has been improved a lot in recent research, and especially by Diana Mutz hearing the other side. She actually looks at people who talk to people who disagree with them. But what does she find? She finds that people under such cross pressures withdraw from politics. That the people who are politically active are homophilous together with people who agree with them. And they form social movements and sometimes achieve change. But the people who do what Habermas thinks they should be doing are out there, I mean, withdrawing. And this is like Lazarsfeld, who said, who found that cross pressures delay voting, that people who are under cross pressures are slower to get to the poll, to decide whom to vote for, and so on, as if his media psychology ambivalence actually works. <laughs> That ambivalence is paralyzed, is the generic <coughs> conclusion. Okay, last. Spiral of silence. What happened to the concept? Am I okay for time? Yes. What happened to the concept? I have no idea what, when to stop, because I'm only beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, a spiral of silence has roots in the Columbia concept of pluralistic ignorance. That is that I think I'm the only homosexual until Kinsey publishes his report and I realize that 15% of us are homosexuals and I suddenly can say what I think or who I am. And similarly, it's the emperor's new clothes. It's people who think themselves to be in minorities don't change their mind so much, but don't speak up. They, they shut themselves in the closet or anywhere. So that's a concept which we ought to think about and whether it works. 
And again, like all these others, like all five, they sometimes work and sometimes don't. And we aren't really sure, and they refuse to die. So they either seek a, what do you call this, a protected living uh, in a home, a retirement home, <laughs> or immortality. So I leave you, I mean, I'm really going to stop. I leave you with this question of where are we in the persuasion business? One thing that seems obvious to me, but maybe not to you, is that the target of persuade on the basis of this review, is that the target of persuasion is not an individual. It's a network or a group or a social movement or something that people don't change by themselves. They change together with somebody or with a group. Or so I'll stop here because it's a good place to stop. <laughs> Can we have a discussion? Yes, yes. We have plenty of time for questions and comments. So please, Jonathan, go ahead. Yes. Uh, you know, I was wondering, has anyone done work on the sort of empirically finding out whether opinion leaders really relay or filter or change? What actually do opinion no. leaders say? I don't think so. I mean, I, I don't. Okay. I really don't think so, but I, as I say, I'm presenting myself as an antiquarian. I don't consider myself up to date. And I only thought of that idea while preparing for this, that why hasn't anybody studied whether they just relay or whether they censor? It seems obvious that they do. Um, I forgot to say one thing, if you're making notes, that under the heading of two-step flow, you should think about Bennett, who thinks there's a one-step flow. This relates to my conclusion, because the new media are so tailored to individuals that you don't need a, a middleman to find out what's relevant for our group and what is not. Okay, correct. <coughs> Additional questions or comments or ideas? With the Bennett idea of the single step now with the new media, the, the data I've seen testing that still suggests it's the two step, that the opinion leaders are using the new technology more than the rest of the people and they're still filtering it. Yeah. You know, it's a study of a British election. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Where do you see that? Um, I can send you the citation. No, because um, Coleman and Blumler have just done a book. Oh, doesn't this work? Coleman and Blumler at Leeds have just done a study of the British elections, and I wondered whether it might be there. It might be that one. I'm in the wrong social psychology. <laughs> Go ahead. Over here, uh, listening to you talk about cross pressures, uh, I was I was thinking about the elections. It's so, it's so close now, and I'm wondering. It, it, it kind of struck me as, um, if true, a little depressing, right? Because you have these people, there is this hope that someday the, you know, the Catholic who is pro-choice will, you know, change, change things, the sort of typical demographic block, voting block. Um, is it pessimistic that those people will, in fact, die away? I mean, what do you think? You mean, will people who are, are outside of... Uh, change the system, or will the system beat them out of existence? Well, I, I was going to talk about some big changes that we've seen, which we should explain. 
how is it that there's less belief in God in a number of societies? Uh, how is it that, uh, where well, I have some other. Um, or the Arab Spring is a good example of pluralistic ignorance, I think, uh, of a trigger of a lot of things. But one is that people feel something and suppress it for a long time. And suddenly, it looks like a major social change, and it is. But it's not a change in beliefs. It's a change in acting out or expressing those beliefs. So I'm not answering your question, I know. But it's, uh, uh, but what I'm trying to say is we should collect some of these big changes, the vote for Obama, despite racialism or ostensible racialism, are examples of the diffusion or really the outburst of change, which deserve more study, not as cases so much, but as a, a bunch, about whether a deviant from a group will be swallowed up or ignored or excommunicated or something. I don't know. I'm thinking whether there has been or perhaps is likely to be a, sort of a, a change in the basic idea, sort of a meta change in, in what we consider homophily. That is, that people will accept that it's okay to disagree because there's such a difference in the way the media is structured today versus the 50s or, or 60s. Um, and so everyone, I think, knows that there's a variety of opinions and, and that people disagree. And won't the basic notion that we have to agree with each other in order to be civil, won't that, or hasn't that changed already? That's so that a good point. So it's a, it's a cultural change. Mm -hmm. And you're, I would have thought that there's a different, let's say, Israeli culture, at least the way we think of it, is argumentative. So much so that you can't even hear the other side because they're yelling at each other, both in face-to-face -face and in political talk shows. You can hardly sort it out. But it seems to be different from, let's say, England, where some kind of discipline prevails. Um, so yes, I think there might be something in what you say that maybe differing is less frightening um, maybe argument is more acceptable in certain cultures and maybe in Western media and thus in the, their cultures than we had thought. Michael. I, I, I just uh, a thought was, uh, came up as you were talking and, and, and this exchange was going on. I was thinking about gay marriage in the U.S. As, as an example of a radical shift in a short period of time. And the thought that came up from that, what, what, what you think, is that I'm just wondering if the notion of homophily, if you, if you dig into it, suggests there are certain things that are identity markers for that homophilous group. And those things are non-negotiable. But when something stops becoming an identity marker. I can be a right-wing, talk show listening, conservative, and not be opposed to this. Then everything changes. The moment that that position is not part of my identity marker in that group. So it would suggest that shifts happen when, when something kind of is no longer in that part of the, that identity marker role. I wonder what your thoughts are on that. No, I think it's a great point. And what you're saying is that the change is in identity markers, not in the specific content of gay marriage, let's say. It's very close to agenda setting, which is another concept I would have worked on if I had another half hour. <laughs> um, but 
I think it's a very good point, and I was going to say something else. Um, no, okay, I'm trying to, there's another thought that I had when you spoke. I don't know, I'll work on it. Additional questions or comments or ideas? So please join me in thanking once again our keynote speaker. I Professor want to Lisa. say one other oh. thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's another possible explanation for limited effects. And that's the explanation of the Frankfurt School, which says the media have nothing to do with change. The media are in charge of non-change. So that's a really outside-the-box kind of idea, which we shouldn't forget. But I don't know if that's right or not. Why don't the health people say that, media? Why don't you say that the media work in health? The media try to change. The media do what they want. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now they can apply. Thank <laughs> you.